From all kinds of flowers, seek teachings everywhere. Like a deer that finds a quiet place to graze, seek seclusion to digest all you have gathered. All the various types of teachings and spiritual paths are related to the different capacities of understanding that different individuals have. There does not exist, from an absolute point of view, any teaching which is more perfect or effective than another. teaching's value lies solely in the inner awakening which an individual can arrive at through it. If a person benefits from a given teaching, for that person that teaching is the supreme path because it is suited to his or her nature and capacities. There's no sense in trying to judge it as more or less elevated in relation to other paths to realization. In general, people say we are following Dharma and speak of it as a kind of religion created by Buddha Shakyamuni. That is not the correct point of view. The Buddha never created any kind of school or religion. The Buddha was a totally enlightened being someone beyond our limited point of view. The teaching of the Buddha is to have presence in that knowledge. Realization is not knowledge about the universe, but the living experience of the nature of the universe. Until we have such living experience, we remain dependent on examples and subject to their limits. All the philosophical theories that exist have been created by the mistaken dualistic minds of human beings. In the realm of philosophy, that which today is considered true may tomorrow be proved to be false. No one can guarantee a philosophy's validity. 
because of this, any intellectual way of seeing is always partial and relative. The fact is that there is no truth to seek or to confirm logically. Rather, what one needs to do is to discover just how much the mind continually limits itself in a condition of dualism. Duality is the real root of our suffering and of all our conflicts. All our concepts and beliefs, no matter how profound they may seem, are like nets which trap us in dualism. When we discover our limits, we have to try to overcome them, untying ourselves from whatever type of religious, political or social conviction may contain us. We have to abandon such concepts as enlightenment, the nature of the mind and so on until we no longer neglect to integrate our knowledge with our actual existence. The truth is that a better society will only arise through the evolution of the individual. This is because society is made up of millions of individuals. To count to a million, one has to start with number one, which means one has to start with the individual the only real place one can actually begin to change something. This doesn't mean putting oneself first in an egotistical way, but rather it involves our coming to understand the condition of the whole of humanity through understanding our own experience. With this experience as our guide, we will know how to behave with awareness in any circumstance, in every type of society. In Zogchen, one learns to become responsible for oneself without following rules. A person who follows rules is like a blind person who needs someone to guide them in order to be able to walk. For this reason, it is said that a Dzogchen practitioner must open his or her eyes to discover their condition so that they will no longer be dependent on anyone or anything. Controlling the position of one's body and keeping a straight back are not contemplation, but can in fact become an obstacle to contemplation.
when leaving the body uncontrolled is spoken of, what is meant is simply allowing the body to remain in an authentic, uncorrected condition in which it is not necessary to modify or improve anything. This is because since all our attempts at correcting the body come from the reasoning mind, they are all false and artificial. Someone who begins to develop an interest in the teachings can tend to distance themselves from the reality of material things, as if the teachings were something completely apart from daily life. Often, at the bottom of all this, there is an attitude of giving up and running away from one's own problems with the illusion that one will be able to find something that will miraculously help one to transcend all that. But the teachings are based on the principle of our actual human condition. We have a physical body with all its various limits. Each day we have to eat, work, rest and so on. This is our reality and we can't ignore it. It can happen that a phrase intended to indicate a state beyond concepts just becomes another concept in itself. In the same way that if you ask a person their name and they reply that they have no name, you will then perhaps mistakenly call them no name. Our mind is the basis of everything. And from our mind, everything arises. Samsara and Nirvana. Ordinary sentient beings and enlightened ones. Consider the way beings transmigrate in the impure vision of Samsara even though the essence of the mind, the true nature of our mind is totally pure right from the beginning. Nevertheless, because pure mind is temporarily obscured by the impurity of ignorance, there is no self-recognition of our own state. Thus, various negative karmic causes are accumulated and since their maturation as effects is inevitable, one suffers bitterly, transmigrating in the six states of existence. Thus, not recognizing one's own state is the cause of transmigration. And through this cause, 
one becomes a slave of illusions and distractions. Beyond the mind, beyond our thoughts, there is something we call the nature of the mind. The mind's true condition, which is beyond all limits. If it is beyond the mind though, how can we approach an understanding of it? Let's take the example of a mirror. When we look into a mirror, we see in it the reflected images of any objects that are in front of it. We don't see the nature of the mirror. But what do we mean by this nature of the mirror? We mean its capacity to reflect. Definable as its clarity, its purity and its limpidity. which are indispensable conditions for the manifestation of reflections. This nature of the mirror is not something visible and the only way we can conceive of it is through the images reflected in the mirror. In the same way, we only know and have concrete experience of that which is relative to our condition of body, voice and mind. But this itself is the way to understand their true nature. The light of the sun is the manifestation of the clarity of the sky and the sky is the basic condition necessary for the manifestation of the sun's light. So too in the sky two, three, four, or any number of suns could arise. But the sky always remains indivisibly one sky. Likewise, every individual state of presence is unique and distinct. But the void nature of the individual is universal and common to all beings.
enlightenment or nirvana is nothing other than the state beyond all obstacles. In the same way that from the peak of a very high mountain, one always sees the sun. Nirvana is not a paradise or some special place of happiness, but is in fact the condition beyond all dualistic concepts including those of happiness and suffering. Thus, when we awaken, finding ourselves in a state of presence, We look with a bare attention into the face of that very state of presence to see what may be there, thereby a non-dual primal awareness becomes present. When all our obstacles have been overcome, and we find ourselves in a state of total presence, the wisdom of enlightenment manifests spontaneously, without limits. Just like the infinite rays of the sun, the clouds have dissolved and the sun is finally free to shine once again. Thank you.